Good, thank you, Neil. Good morning, everyone. Thanks all of you for making time to be with us today and be part of this conversation on how the VGTs have been used, are being used, and can be used to strengthen and secure tenure rights, particularly those of most vulnerable uh, people whose rights are not or have been have not been recognized. Uh, we have, as you know, uh, this side event, which is uh, organized uh, it, on the sidelines of the CFS 48. The CFS is the, uh, as you know, the, the platform that endorses the voluntary guidelines. And now we will look into how the, the VETs uh, are a tool to, again, secure tenure rights by the different uh, people, including in women, indigenous people, small farmers, whose rights have not been recognized. Uh, this event will look a specific, a, a, sorry, specifically into how those rights are being allocated, how they are transferred, and how uh, transactions are undertaken. As you may recall, the voluntary guidelines are specifically Article 7 calls for governments to identify tenure rights who are, have not been secured, those who are the rightful holders, legitimate holders of those rights, and facilitate their recognition. As, as we know, having secure tenure rights is central for livelihoods, to secure livelihoods, to secure investments, and to promote sustainable food systems in the long run. So we are talking about a central issue which again has to do with securing tenure rights, which for which we need open and transparent systems. Uh, we'll have a good lineup today here. We have a good solid experts who will share with us their expertise, their views on how the v VGTs can be used to improve, promote, have these open and transparent systems to secure tenure rights. We have Sam, I would call it Sam Zoke Burki, senior legal researcher for the Columbia Center for Sustainable Investments. That's uh, the Earth Institute, I believe, Columbia University in New York. He will, he will not be with us today, but he has prepared a video that will show us uh, the work they have been doing on land investments and how that involved local people recognizing legal rights and the participation of those involved in those uh, investments. Then we have a, a Tim Hampstead, leads of the Chandler Foundation as his first CEO based in Seattle. And uh, he, he has worked with Landesa and Landesa, as you know, is a, a, is a institution with extensive expertise on tenure issues. We have now uh, Natalie Carfi from Argentina. Uh, she is the deputy director of the Open Data Charter, and uh, she will share with us her views and expertise on this matter. Uh, next, we'll have our colleague, uh, Laura Mejolaro. Uh, she is the team leader of the Land Porter Foundation, who uh, actually has you know, facilitated the organization of this side event. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Lamporto. And she will uh, share uh, with us uh, her uh, uh, views, expertise on how data is being exchanged, how uh, dialogue, policy dialogues are being promoted to uh, further enhance tenure rights. And we have, last but not least, uh, Honorable Ellen Pratt, a commissioner of land use and management and land management with the Liberian Land Authority. That will be a great voice from the field to hear how Liberia is dealing with these issues and how the Liberia experience can, you know, can shed light on the way forward to securing tenure rights. Um, as I said before, unfortunately, Sam, uh, Sam Soke Burki from uh, Columbia University won't be able to join us, but we have a video that will show us some key messages that they would like to convey to us on this matter. And with this, I will invite the, or the colleagues dealing with the logistics here to uh, let us uh, see the video. Hi, I'm Sam Zoki Burke, Senior Legal Researcher at the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment. 
I'd like to thank the organizers and my colleagues on this panel for the opportunity to make this presentation by video ahead of time. Today's topic focuses on innovations in open and transparent land governance. And to borrow from a recent CCSI report on this topic, we must ask for whom? Transparency initiatives can have a range of beneficiaries, including regulators, community members, citizens, journalists, each of whom may have different needs. So designing systems that meet such needs will be crucial if we want to avoid less dominant actors, such as communities, Indigenous peoples and women being left behind. I'd like to focus on transparency in the context of land-based investments specifically, given the immense land pressures that agribusiness, forestry and renewable energy projects are currently causing. As you can see, land investment transparency has four elements. The first is disclosure of all relevant and accurate information in a timely manner. This includes information about actual or proposed investments, including likely impacts and the actors involved, but it also includes information about relevant rights and laws, including the processes through which decisions will be made. CCSI's own effort in this regard is open land contracts, which currently houses 1,500 land investment contracts and other documents from over 50 countries. The next element is access. Communities, citizens and government actors have to be able to safely access the information. Third is comprehension. Information should be made in understandable formats, which includes translations into local languages and plain language summaries. In the case of open land contracts, for instance, we summarize key contract clauses to aid comprehension for non-legal users. Communities often also need sufficient time to digest information and to access technical support if needed. The final element is information use in open systems. Communities and other actors must be able to access decision-making processes if they want to knowledgeably influence them. More generally, governance systems must be open and democratically responsive. So what are these open systems and decision-making processes that we need and how can, act, how can local actors influence them in practice? The systems and processes I have in mind are wide ranging and often country specific. They include processes enabling decisions on land use planning, the design, on, the design of legal and policy frameworks, through to consideration of proposed investments and the terms of those investments um, that are granted permits. So this also includes consultations, contract negotiations, impact assessments, um, as well as monitoring and enforcement, grievance mechanisms and decisions concerning project closure and what happens to the land afterwards. For communities to access these systems, disclosure is crucial, but it's, it's also insufficient. To influence decisions, communities need information, yes, but also power is going to play a prominent role, meaning that communities will often struggle to have their voice heard. They may need skill building and accompaniment from civil society and other support providers to really grasp what is at stake, prepare and confidently decide on and implement a course of action before it's too late. Because communities, including women and Indigenous peoples, are so often excluded from these processes, they increasingly are turning to processes to set the agenda themselves before it's too late. Um, Community-led processes include autonomous protocols and bylaws, which explain how customary decisions are made within the community, as well as community-driven visions for how the community plans to pursue its own self-determined development. Um, Community-led data collection is another important tool. This can dem democratise the information sources feeding into government decisions concerning land, which can often tilt, otherwise often tilt heavily towards unaccountable com company consultants or re reporting that may not tell the full story. On the government side, we know that information sharing between agencies remains a challenge. This is not only a technical or a financial challenge, it's also a political one. Public actors might be hoarding information or demanding money for it, precisely because being a gatekeeper to such information brings with it power and influence. So while we can and should innovate on intra-governmental information sharing and coordination, we also have to empower those good faith actors within government, sometimes referred to as reformers, 
who earnestly seek to uphold their mandates, but are too often stymied by pressure from above to not make things difficult for certain investors. On this topic, CCSI is currently working to empower specific governmental actors and is preparing a brief on how such actors can build political support to translate good ideas into practice as part of our ALIGN project with IIED and NAMATI. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, thank you for that video. I hope that, that uh, most of you were able to listen to and follow through the whole uh, presentation, despite of some minor noises that we heard. However, um, and I think uh, we, we, we were able to uh, hear some key messages here and some key words that I heard, including, for instance, information, access to information and data, consultation, consultation process and decision making within the communities themselves. I think those are key words to a, an open and transparent systems in land governance. So I would like to hear from Tim, uh, who comes from a very extensive background, particularly when I, 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 I hear that you work with Landesa. Landesa is a well-recognized institution with extensive expertise on these issues. What are your views on this? What are your take on, on, on these uh, uh, issues? Over to you, Tim. Thank you, Javier, and uh, good morning uh, to everyone. Um, I, I want to start by just giving a shout out, given this is a CFS side event, to uh, to the CFS for their role in, in developing and endorsing and, and maintaining the voluntary guidelines on, on responsible uh, governance of tenure. Um, I think it's been about nine years since they were they were endorsed and they've served as a I think great guidance for for governments in in uh, making steps forward to uh, improve governance of land tenure. But I I want to provide just the kind of the big picture here. Um, today's session involves the intersection of two topics that I believe deserve to be much more elevated on the global development agenda. This is the first being secure land rights and the second being corruption. Um, and it's worth, I think, taking a big picture view of these two topics and their intersection before delving into the specifics. So first on secure land rights, why are they important and deserving of more intention? Um, well, in some, the well-being of every person on the planet, and, and indeed the well-being of the planet itself depends on secure land rights. Secure land rights and capable land institutions are a cornerstone of any modern economy. They, strong land rights upheld by land institutions provide housing security, they give confidence, to individuals to invest in land and businesses. They help bolster food security. They allow companies and households to, to more easily access uh, financing. They enable governments to collect property taxes. They're a foundation for environmental stewardship. And, and you know, we could go on and on about their importance. And they're particularly important for the, the poorest people on the planet, a, a large majority of whom rely on land-based livelihoods and, and yet their relationship to the land on which they depend, that their land rights, is, is often lacking, which constrains their ability to grow food, to have a voice, to build wealth, and to resiliently manage the, uh, the inevitable hardships that, that life brings. So without secure land rights, which, which are made possible in, in significant part by responsible land governance institutions that accurately maintain, that gather and maintain land data. Societies risk missing the foundation for sustainable prosperity. Uh, that's a, a problem for all people, but it's particularly a problem for the, for the lives and the livelihoods of those living at the margins. But open and transparent land governance is also necessary to fight the cancer of corruption. And corruption, like secure land rights, is another topic deserving of much more attention on the global development agenda. 
corruption erodes trust, it weakens democracy, it, it hampers economic development, it further exacerbates inequality, poverty, social division. And broadly speaking, uh, levels of corruption are highly correlated with, uh, with the lack of prosperity. And high corruption is one of the best proxies for, for governance. It's, corruption is just a cancer. It, it's a cancer that substantially limits the ability of government institutions, including land institutions, to provide the good governance necessary to build an inclusive prosperity. And unfortunately, land agencies are often among the most corrupt of, of government agencies. That's, that's what research from around the world tells us. Uh, it also tells us that one in five people worldwide have paid bribes to access land services. In some countries, that, that number uh, rises to one in two. And such land corruption can flourish when, of course, the land governance in institutions lack transparency. So to fight corruption, we have to embrace transparency. And transparency is all about knowing the who, the why, the what, the how, the how much. It means shedding light on the formal and informal rules, processes, actions, and data. And, and transparency is not only about making the information available, but ensuring it can be easily accessed, understood, and used by, by citizens. So in sum, and I, I know this is like very simplistic for some people, but I think this, this big picture is important. Weak land rights and corruption are major problems constraining inclusive development and food security. Now, there is reason for hope, and I think much reason for hope, uh, and particularly the, the ongoing revolution in information and communications technology provides unprecedented opportunities to gather the needed land data to document and protect land rights, to digitize land records and make them more open and transparent. And doing so has the potential to clarify the land rights of, of literally hundreds of millions of people globally and limit the scope for corrupt practices. So in closing, I, I would just highlight four recommendations for governments seeking to reduce corruption and make development more inclusive as they document, digitize, and, and open up land records. So first, important to carefully verify and upgrade the existing land records through a, a robust community-led process before digitizing records. Uh, and the reason is that digitizing inaccurate or incomplete paper records that exist in many settings has the potential of perpetuating problems by further validating existing inaccuracies that frequently benefit the powerful. Second, ensure the active participation of women and disadvantaged groups. While a land system that works for the vulnerable will also work for the well-connected, but the inverse is often untrue. So, Women disadvantaged groups must play an active role, not only in collecting the data, but also in the creation and evolution of the land record system itself. Third, to increase transparency and to fight corruption, land data should be open by default. Um, now there can be exceptions to this, but any exceptions should be clearly justified as being necessary to protect the disadvantaged. And finally, and with this I'll close, uh, land governance systems need to be fit for purpose and, and context. That is, current technological possibilities alone should not dictate the design of, of open land data systems. Instead, it's, it's very important for governments to establish their own goals and their own priorities, create an open land data system to fulfill their needs and those needs consistent with the, uh, with the voluntary guidelines. And it's important that context really matters. What, what works in one setting may not work in another, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that later. So 
Javier, sorry, I've gone on too long. With that, I'll close and look forward to the, the questions that come up later in the discussion. Thank you, thank you so much, Tim. I think uh, you touched upon very key issues concerning uh, land uh, administration systems that, and that have to do with data, access to data, data availability, then land institutions, the working of land institutions. And, uh, and so uh, these are key issues uh, because data has to do with land records and land records lead to land rights, who owns what and where. So recognizing these, the, the relevance of data, accessibility, reliability of data, I would like to invite now our colleague, Natalie Carfi, uh, who is the deputy director of the Open Data Charter. And she has experience working also with the undersecretary of public innovation and open government in Argentina. Uh, what is your experience on dealing with uh, data, open data, making data accessible to people and how you collect that data in a way that you are sure that is reliable? I would like to remind uh, all colleagues, all participants to post any questions, to post any comments, reactions through the functions, the questions and, and uh, chat functions so that we can engage more actively in this conversation. Over to you, Natalie. Thank you very much, Javier, and thanks everybody uh, for, for being here. Thanks to the Land Portal for organizing the, the event. I'm gonna use a short presentation just to introduce the work that we've done uh, so far. Let me go through these uh, seconds of trying to figure out the best way to showcase. I guess everybody should be watching now the, the presentation. So um, as Javier said, I'm Natalia Carfi. I'm the interim executive director now of the, of the Open Data Charter, have been working on open data and open government for over 10 years. Um, I'm glad to, to be here. Let me uh, tell you a little bit about us and about the work that we've done on, on open data. So the Open Data Charter is a collaboration between governments and experts working on, on open data. It was funded almost six years ago now because we, we turned six in September. Um, and it, it was a work, a collaborative work around six principles to open up data um, in, on any topic and for every level of, of governments. Um, so now we have 82 governments that have uh, endorsed and adopted the charter and 73 organizations worldwide that have already uh, also endorsed and adopted the charter as their, their way of working with, with open data. These are, are the, the six principles. So we are an organization, but also a, a text. Um, and so these are the six principles that, that we work with uh, alongside with our, our partners, our endorsers and our, our adopters. Uh, the first one being open by default. So we believe that, that uh, governmental data should be open by default. As, as Tim said, of course, there's uh, certain limitations to that like personal data or security, national security data, but the default should be, should be open. It should be open uh, in a timely and comprehensive manner in order for it to be, to be um, actually important to understand what's going on and what government is actually doing. It should be uh, accessible and usable, and that goes straight into the, into the formats. Um, then of course, uh, standards and interoperability, it's important. So uh, the data should be comparable so that we can understand also what, uh, what each level of government is actually doing and what governments are, are doing and trying to compare and understand what's, what's going on in the overall picture. Um, and then, the last two principles go more into, into objectives. Like we, we, we wanna make sure that open data actually improves governance and citizen engagement because it promotes data-driven uh, data policy, policy development and, and data-driven uh, engagement and promote participation. And then of course, understanding that the public value of that data uh, can, uh, can actually help uh, inclusive development and, and innovation. So those are the six principles of, of the Open Data Charter. And with that in mind, we started working um, on this data to impact framework. I'm just gonna go really quick around this, but um, when open data as a movement, as a policy first started almost 12 years ago, um, 
every every government was trying to kind of uh, tick the 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 policy by creating an open data portal and just publishing any type of, of data that they could uh, they could uh, without thinking about the objective of opening up data. Uh, opening up data was the objective. After uh, a couple of, of years of maturing, uh, we understood, and the Open Data Charter actually coined the the, the phrase "publishing with a purpose." So we need to understand the problem that we're trying to tackle while opening up data. Uh, first, think about the problem in a collaborative way with citizens, with um, the, the people that, that will be impact, impacted for the better or for the worst um, uh, when, when you publish the data, and then understand the process that that data is going to go through in order to, to be published. We know uh, that, that uh, Opening up data is not is not seem is not easy. It's not uh, even uh, for free. You need to have a team in order to be able to secure that that you're um, you're publishing high quality data. That there's no uh, personal data in those data sets that you're going to open. Uh, so understanding the pr the purpose and prioritizing data, uh, it's an important step before opening up uh, opening up governmental data. So publish with a purpose is it's uh, even a, a seventh principle uh, that anybody should understand when uh, talking about open data and open data policies implementation. So the open data charter uh, has has uh, always worked with uh, a collaborative approach to things. So we know about open data, but we're not specialists, uh, thematic specialists. So we've partnered with with organizations from from around the world um, in order to create these these tools, these practical tools that we call the open up guides. Uh, so we've we've created four. Uh, Laura is going to talk a little bit more about the, the land governance one, but I want to give the the um, the overall structure of, of the guide and why it's important that we keep working in this in this way. So the open up guides. Uh, the idea is to understand what are the key data sets that any government can open in order to tackle a specific problem. In this case, these four uh, public issues in order to, to start an open data policy around each of these topics. So we've created an agriculture one, a climate action one, where we work with the World Resources Institute, the anti-corruption one that actually uh, we've created with, with uh, Transparency International's chapter in Mexico, and the land governance where we work with land portal. Uh, the idea is to understand how government collects, manages, and releases sectorial data to improve uh, their, their connection with data users, the ability, the, availability and the decision making and, and innovation. So these open up guides are, are practical tools that are online. Um, and we'll, we'll go through a couple of examples to let you know how this looks like. So any open, open up guide actually has key data sets, as I said, like critical data sets, um, proposals on how they should be collected, stored, shared, and, and published. Um, we are not invent, reinventing the wheel. If there's already existing standards that are, are proposed in, in order to publish any type of data, uh, they will be in the open up guide, for example. Um, so any um, open contracting data, we, we promote the standard that open contracting partnership is actually uh, using. Um, then of course, we want to we want to be able to leverage what's already been done and what's already been done for good. So we always under try to figure out and and do research and connect with uh, good data policies and frameworks, uh, understanding which is the me metadata that needs to be there. As I said, standards and and the governance frameworks where they are because not every type of data has a governance framework that's been developed. Um, try to understand what are the gaps or the challenges of each of these thematic policies and some use cases, because examples always, always are helpful to understand the, the problems, the challenges and the do's and the don'ts. Um, and for example, just the, the anti-corruption open up guide, we implemented it in, in Mexico. Uh, you see there, there's uh, 30 data sets that compose actually the, the anti-corruption uh, open up guide. But in Mexico that translated when we did the, um, the mapping of the ex existing data that actually translated into 72 data sets because of the way the data was being collected and created within government. 
um, 16 institutions within the executive, the executive uh, branch actually, um, sorry, 60 data sets from within the executive branch actually were, were leveraged. Uh, some some new data sets were created in order to to uh, to uh, promote publication for anti-corruption, and uh, and we understood that there were 350 uh, data data points in uh, that were feeding into the pro into the open up sorry into the open data portal, uh, working on open data for anti-corruption. So uh, from from theory to practice, there's always a, a translation, and this was this was super important. Then we implemented the open up guide on on uh, on climate action in Uruguay. So we did we did a mapping from the 72 data sets that are are uh, part of the climate action um, and climate action open up guide. Uh, only 20 uh, had some degree of, of openness, but we were working with the Ministry of Environment and AGESIC, which is the digital ag um, agency there. Um, and we worked with them and with data reusers and people from the climate action uh, community to co-create a strategy for opening up data. Uh, and since then, 20, 29 that new data sets have been opened. Um, we have worked within government to improve data skills and, uh, and new visualizations from data reusers have been used, uh, have been created, sorry, to showcase the, green, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions. So people are already using the new data sets. Um, what we've learned so far by, by uh, implementing the open up guys that we've, we've implemented so far, it's important to talk about data interoperability, but also about people interoperability, participation and, and collaborative part, um, co co-creation and prioritization of key data sets. It's important um, within government. Many, many times we see that there's no cooperation even within agencies. So um, we, we kind of started talking it maybe as, as kind of a, 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 a joke about people interoperability, but it's actually one of the key um, the key ideas and the, the key uh, takeouts that we got from these implementations. We need to build those bridges. We help br be, uh, build those bridges, even as a, uh, as a strategy, because the open data charter is not going to be there for forever. Um, so we leave those, those connections done. Um, the guides are useful for these multi-stakeholder conversations. When we talk with NGOs, with universities, uh, with different communities, having a framework such as, an, as a guide with uh, an already set proposal of key data sets actually helps out uh, in conversations. And for example, the anti-corruption the anti open up guide um, was taken as the umbrella for a hemispheric uh, open data for anti-corruption um, program for the whole of the Americas. Um, so this, this guide actually was the framework where government's uh, dis discussions took place. So it, it helped out with, with a massive conversation. Um, it's really important to engage with possible reusers and, and get feedback from the very, very beginning of any open data process. Um, data assessments to understand the situation on, on key data sets, like if they even are, if that data is even collected it's really important and it's open and it's uh, there's the need to be open about that in order to manage expectations in these participatory uh, processes, understand the situation. Um, it's very important to document the data production and the data quality in order to be able to to move forward. And um, I'm just I'm, I'm going to I'm going to move really, really quickly. Just uh, one of the key ideas is. Um, we need to we need to understand that for data to be opened, we need to resource alloca allocation and monitor progress, uh, so that we are open in 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 the prioritization process and how much uh, can be done. Um, and I think I'm done. Yeah, thank you very much for the the time. And uh, I'm gonna yeah. Thank you so much, Natalie or oh, Natalia. <laughs> thank you so much very much uh, for your. Uh, for your uh, presentation, for all the, these ideas. I think uh, the role of, of, of data, of open data, cannot be overemphasized. And uh, although there is a question here from, from participants concerning private, privacy issues when we have open data, but we can discuss that during the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the open dialogue uh, period. Uh, now I would like to invite our colleague Laura uh, Mejalaro from the LAN portal, they have a very solid, good 
knowledge on how to handle data, make data available to, to uh, stakeholders and uh, engage, facilitate discussion. So Laura, what will be your, your, uh, your, your views on this uh, issue? Over to you. Thank you, thank you for Javier. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on where you are in the world. And let me just continue the conversation that uh, Natalia started on the Open Up Guide that the Land Portal Foundation, together with the Open Data Charter, have um, created and launched uh, two weeks ago, uh, and how they contribute, of course, to the voluntary guidelines, which is and and, and uh, foster open data systems, which is the topic of today panel. So the Land Portal, um, as you know. Um, is a promoter of uh, data sharing and uh, is a platform that promotes inclusive dialogue and debates uh, on land data, and which is an issue that has been raised already uh, by my colleagues today. It is why I wanted to start my intervention by uh, quoting, no, by sharing an insight that I read on a blog that was published on the, on the land port a few days ago by Louisa Johnson, our colleague from the FAO uh, voluntary guidelines uh, team. So Lu Louisa, uh, Louisa writes, um, in contrast to other global uh, issues such as the climate crisis, no, which no single state, no single actor no, can prevent or fight in isolation. So most land governance issues can be solved within a state. So what does it mean? What, what, what does it mean, this sentence? It means that the, the individual governments are in the driver's seat when it comes to responsible land governance. So they, have, uh, they can generate uh, favorable or less favorable uh, conditions uh, to secure uh, land rights. So, um, and this is precisely why our open up guide on land governance is directed not, not only, but mainly to governments because they control most of land data in a country. So governments are the main custodians of land data. So the Open Up Guide is the first uh, of its kind and is a, is a, is a tool, is a, is, a, um, is a kind of a playbook for governments which uh, who have the mandates or, or an interest no, in making their land governance data more open and available. So land governance data is collected by government agencies as they carry out the core land administration uh, functions and includes uh, tenure of land, the use of land, the development of land for constructions or for agriculture, the value of land and so on. These are the main uh, data types that the, 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 govern, the, the, open, up govern, the open up guide uh, analyzes. No? So for monitoring uh, the performance of, of any uh, data or any indicators related, relating to these um, uh, four categories uh, of, of data, uh, you need data to be um, readily available. So someone already mentioned this, no? and, and Natalie already uh, highlighted the importance of data that is timely, up to date, no? that is standardized and widely distributed to create impact. So some countries are already doing a good job in uh, managing and collecting uh, and publishing open and reusable data. Other countries may seek advice on how to start or how to expand their activities or how to test their, 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 uh, their work against uh, best practices, best international practices. So the, 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 the land ownership data um, still is consistently ranked lowest on the global open data index and the open data barometer. So each and every year, this data is highlighted as the least likely to be opened by government. So government usually do not publish in an open format uh, primary data related to land governance. Why? We identify four main reasons for that. Um, and some colleagues have already mentioned some of these reasons. Privacy concern, so land data contains personal data, restrict data that should be restricted, not be published. Uh, because of mismanagement of this data already, this has been mentioned already. In, in many countries, land, the, 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 the data uh, uh, landscape is characterized by um, patchy and over, overlapping record systems. So data is uh, scattered and fragmented across different jurisdictions and, and, and the land agencies. 
some data has uh, um, is, is not good. There is a lot of gap in, in the quality of the data. Simply, some data has never been historically collected. Think about the customary land rights data that, that the document customary land rights of data related to uh, gender. So, and the corruption. Corruption is, is not, maybe another uh, reason, and my colleagues have already explained that it, corruption is widespread in the land sector. And finally, the lack of know-how, lack of technical capacity. So the capacity gap at the government level has been identified on how government should collect, manage, and publish, and license land data. So the, there is also a technical uh, gap there, um, and also financial gap as well. Land data and land information yet is a public good. So, and public good has, uh, and, and the public, so the, 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 the citizens has, uh, have a right to access it. So when, my point is, whenever we refer to good land governance, we should also pay attention and refer to good data governance. So data governance should become part of the land governance agenda. And, um, Although data cannot be a goal in itself, of course, is certainly an important means to good land governance. So why uh, open data? So why uh, an open up uh, guide on land governance? So um, it is true that land governance is particularly vulnerable and prone to corruption. My colleagues have already uh, elaborated uh, on this, but at the same time, uh, this is a practical uh, guide to help government make land administration more efficient, um, deliver better services, more cost-effective services, including, um, including uh, collecting, sharing, and, and more and better data, data that civil society can use, our researchers can use, but also companies, private companies can use to generate any impact. So going back to Louisa blog, uh, this open up guide is somehow similar to uh, the voluntary guidelines in the sense that is a, um, is a voluntary instrument, but yet is an instrument that promotes reform through multi-stakeholder dialogue, political consensus and international good practices in this way is similar. So likewise, the, the, our open up guide gives the government, but also anyone else that is involved in land policy from the public sector, from the academia, from the, from the private sector, um, some some direction, no? some uh, some uh, some some guidelines, no, to to overcome the, all the challenges uh, and 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 also the repercussions of of the mis uh, misgovernance uh, of land. So we encourage governments, donors, and key data players to join this conversation because again, land portal is a place for dialogue, for conversation, for collaboration. And this is what we try to encourage within the sector. We want to pilot this guide in several countries, but also we want to improve the guide as a tool, as a model that can drive innovation and positive change in the land governance sector. So the open up guide is open for consultation until end of July. Please have your say please um, share your feedback and be part of the conversation. Thank you so much, Javier. Back to you. Thank you, Laura. And now we have an invitation from her. So colleagues, take note. And so please, I hope you will be able to participate in this consultation. Now we have our last uh, guest speaker. I see also uh, our colleague, Chris uh, Higadorn from CFS Secretariat also would like to join the conversation. I would like to uh, invite first our uh, guest speaker, Ellen uh, Pratt, um, as I said before, Commissioner of the Land Use and Land Management uh, with the Liberian Land Authority. I think that would be good to hear from her in, in, because Liberia is one of the countries at the front line of improving governance of tenures based on the voluntary guidelines. Liberia has been one of the examples we have been looking at in Africa as how to use the VGTs to improve governance tenure to secure tenure rights, particularly under customary tenure. I think she will be very happy to share with us her, their experience. And I think her experience will also address one of the questions raised there in the, in the question and answer function 
which is um, how the VTs have been used to help secure tenure rights under customary tenure. And so I, but, and after, afterwards, I will let you uh, invite Chris to uh, take the floor. Over to you, Ellen. Thank you very much. And good morning, good night, good evening. Um, let me first say thank you to the CFS for this platform and also to the land portal for the invitation to participate. And as many of my colleagues have already stated, a lot of land governance and the initiative and drive for sustainable land governance comes from government. So as the Liberia Land Authority, we play a pivotal role and we will continue to play a pivotal role in land governance in Liberia. Just to give some background, the Land Authority is a new organization. We were legislated in 2016 as a one-stop shop for land administration in Liberia, simply because of all of the corruption, all of the uh, inequalities and lack of transparency in land governance spread across a multiplicity of agencies. So this new agency was tasked with a broad mandate, but essentially effective land governance, equitable land governance. And fast forward to 2018, with the help of our multi-stakeholder platform of the VGGT, uh, Liberia passed the landmark legislation in support of land rights called the Land Rights Act or the Land Rights Law of 2018. We will argue that it is one of the most progressive laws in support of customary land tenure on the African continent. What this law has done is for the first time in our nation's history, we are recognizing the customary tenure rights of Liberians who have lived on their lands for generations. Prior to this law, all of that land was considered public land. And now as of the passage of this law, it is customary land. And there are guidelines that customary communities must follow in order to have their land regularized. However, as of the passage of the law, the land is in fact the, under the ownership or custodianship of the customary communities that have lived on that land. And the VGGT came, uh, was implemented in Liberia in 2014. And since that time, the consortium made up of uh, cross uh, stakeholders, government, private sector, donor partners, NGOs, CSOs, NGOs have been instrumental in not only the passage of this law, but also in working with governments to spread the message, if you will. And that is very important because you have a law, but this law does not answer the question of equality. It does not answer the question of promoting women's land rights in the absence of actions, in the absence of implementation guidelines, in the absence of the actual presence and uh, information shared with the community. So even with the passage of this law, we find that there are several challenges. And one of them, most of our panelists have outlined here today, and that is data. But I will also say that uh, a key challenge for us is the lack of information. And what we've tried to do when we speak about innovation is we've taken what is a very complex law, we've broken it down into simple English, I will say that, because you know 43% of our population is illiterate. So how do you explain how this law can change your life if you do not speak in the language of the people? So key provisions of the law, particularly the uh, sections that speak to customer land tenure have been translated into local languages as well as broken down for lack of a better phrase into what we call Liberian English, which is a colloquial form of English that most Liberians speak. And now this message is starting to resonate with our communities. We still have a major challenge of our budgetary constraints as a government to reach the length and breadth and depth of the country to spread this message. But with our partners, particularly the multi-stakeholder platform, we are getting the message across. I think that also the VGGT platform has helped us to coordinate our, um, our partners a little bit better because one of the major issues that we've had as a country is not only is there a lack of data, there's a lack of coordinated data. So you find that many agencies are collecting information, but the platform is not shared, is not interoperable. 
and we're not speaking to each other. So the messages could get crossed and that we see happening in the landscape quite a lot. So the Liberia Land Authority is not only trying to one, promote the messaging, work with communities to get their customary land deeds and then the supporting structures that follow. So you have a deed to your land. What does that mean for you as a community? We're working with communities to develop land use plans so that they understand or have a vision for how they would like to see their land and how this land could help to promote livelihood creation, poverty alleviation. 54% of Liberia's population lives below the poverty line. Most of that population is in rural Liberia. Most of that population are the people that are affected by this customary land tenure. So it is important and it's an intrinsic part of our Liberian fabric that we promote customary land rights, that we support women's land rights, because again, our women are responsible for 70% of our agriculture in the rural communities. They too need land rights in order to continue to farm, continue to care for their families. I've noted what Laura said that, you know, it is governments that are in the driving seat. And I think we take that responsibility very seriously. Not only is this law a catalytic change for Liberia and the Liberian economy, it is also a way to catapult our people out of poverty. And how we do it is, will be the test of time. I will want to also extend a thank you to the Open Up Guide. I will raise my hand and say that we are prepared to pilot this guide in Liberia. I think I noticed that you're working in our neighboring country, Sierra Leone. So we encourage you to please come across the river and join us because it is very important. I think our, one of our major weaknesses is still the data integration. I think Tim also spoke about the importance of not digitizing the wrong, wrong information. And we have a plethora of uh, illegal transactions in our land administration system, which is still a manual system. So as we develop our systems, it's important that digitize correct information. And what does that mean? That means that we as the authority need to understand the data we have. We need to dig deeper into this data and we need to be able to throw out what is not correct, what is not validated, what has not been vetted as we migrate from a manual to an electronic and digital system. So I thank you all for the opportunity and I look forward to the dialogue. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Helen. Um, yes, indeed, that's very inspiring. I mean, Liberia, as I said before, is one of the countries that have been very proactive in uh, taking up the, the VETs to improve governance of tenure. Uh, but we are aware, very mindful that quite, quite a few challenges are ahead, lie on the road. And in this regard, I would like to invite now our colleagues from the CFS Secretariat, Chris uh, Hegadorn, to, to share with us his views on this because uh, after eight years, actually it's gonna be nine years of it, uh, next year gonna be 10 of the endorsement of the VETs, how, the, from your perspective, how, you see this process is moving forward, considering now that we have some lessons learned and challenges ahead, how we can tackle those challenges, such as we heard corruption. Well, from your perspective, uh, what, uh, what can be done? Thank well, you. Thanks, Chris. Javier, it's a pleasure. Um, I don't know if my video can be turned on, but at least you have a picture of what I look like. Um, I also can't tell exactly how many people are with us, but even if it's even if it's uh, just five. Now you are muted. You are muted, Chris. Ah, okay. So I, there we go. Okay. Well, good morning. Thanks, Javier. Um, thanks, Neil, Laura, uh, Ellen. Uh, great speeches, Ellen. Um, you know, having having your country perspective is is so important, and I think you raised some incredibly important points. Look, as part of the uh, representing the CFS Secretariat, um, you know, the the CFS VGGT is certainly one of, or if not the product of which um, I certainly personally and I think the team is most proud of, because it really highlights. Um, exactly what the CFS was uh, designed to do and reformed to do in 2009. Um, 
and along with the rye principles, um, which often go very nicely hand in hand uh, with the CFS VGGT, um, there's so much good news to share. Um, not enough because we know that the uh, issues of land tenure, land governance, um, there's there's just uh, so much work to be done. But um, you know, this, this is the ideal process. We had, if you recall, a special session in May 2012, just like our special session tomorrow, um, where we adopted the VGGT. Um, and this uh, stemmed from a at least a decade of, of great work done at FAO and, and many other organizations. Um, backed by a, a report with the CFS high-level panel of experts and um, and then taken forward over the past nine years, as Javier said, um, by FAO, by the by EFAD, World Bank, the ILC, Land Portal, many, many others, with help of uh, donor states who funded major products, uh, Germany, Switzerland, there's a number of, of ones who have put quite a bit of uh, effort into this issue because they understand how central land is to reaching the VGGTs, to addressing poverty, to addressing uh, women's empowerment, many of the issues Ellen spoke to. So um, another point, you know, the CFS VGGT has become a global reference document on land governance, on land management, on tenure issues. Um, and of course, we're all very proud of that. And we're finally seeing some of the fruits of, of, of that work taking shape where, for example, in 2019, the UN um, uh, Conference on Desertification um, used the reference, the CFS VGGT, as the global reference document around land degradation neutrality. So it's not only gone beyond CFS and beyond FAO and the other agencies mentioned, but into um, binding treaty uh, territory. And I think that can't be underestimated. And I think we all need to keep pushing for that, including with the summit this year, the UN Food Systems Summit, highlighting, 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 you know, every chance we get as advocates of land tenure, land governance, that this issue can't be underestimated. Um, it is, you know, it, it ranks up at the top in terms of transformational issues that have to be addressed to reach the SDGs uh, and the um, ambitions of the summit and, of course, the vision of the CFS, particularly for the most poor and vulnerable where these issues are so acute and so important. So um, I simply will highlight that, um, you know, the context is, is the important thing. Liberia's experience, please, Ellen, join us anytime you want, uh, because your, your presentation was great. The experience is so relevant, um, and we'd like to see more of those um, shared experiences help inform other countries who are struggling with, with many of these same issues. Uh, gender, uh, empowering women, as you rightly pointed out, the questions of governance and, and fighting corruption, which undermines uh, so much of the work, the good, good work that's being done, and, uh, and data. And I, I want to encourage everyone, we are um, not only um, set to address uh, and approve policy recommendations around innovative approaches to food security and nutrition, such as agroecological and others, tomorrow, but we are also starting and next year we will adopt voluntary guidelines on women's empowerment. Um, and we hope uh, that this really takes on these questions of land governance as well and is applied in that context. We are also um, set to produce uh, policy recommendations around data, uh, data collection and its implementation in policy. Um, and that is also, uh, we will start that work this year and we'll be continuing uh, with uh, until we produce and adopt policy recommendations. So um, thank you for letting me, I wasn't planning on speaking, but uh, thanks for the chance, Javier um, and others. And uh, again, please look to us, join us tomorrow for the CFS 48 special session. Uh, look at our website because we have links to not only our own videos, but also the documentation, expert reports done by FAO and others. Um, but let's work together and keep uh, pushing forward on this incredibly important topic. Back to you, Javier. 
Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much. Um, one one key one key issue I think is uh, I mean uh, and was a, uh, somehow uh, referred to by Ellen and also you you, you touched upon is uh, the you using the the VTs to uh, facilitate uh, access to and regularize recognize the rights but most vulnerable vulnerable including including women. Uh, and so I would like to invite now one colleague who has some experience to share on this very issue. And in fact, that would address one of the questions raised in, in the question and answer function here and examples of country, concrete country, country level, concrete examples of how these uh, voluntary guidelines have helped secure tenure rights in a way that is participatory, committed to themselves, collecting data and verifying a uh, land right. So I would like to uh, invite our colleague from FAO, Maria Paula Rizzo, to share with us some experiences. For instance, I can think of Sierra Leone, for example, Guatemala, another one. So I don't want to talk so much. So I would like to uh, invite Maria Paula. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you, thank you, uh, Javier, uh, for uh, uh, for including me in this conversation. It was a really interesting uh, set of intervention, and uh, uh, all very relevant also to the work that we have been doing in the last ten years. So um, uh, I, I was, I mean. Um, interested in some of the words that have been used during this uh, uh, these interventions like uh, Tim has mentioned for instance secure tenure rights corruption Natalia mentioned interoperability of data and people Sam mentioned assessment and consultation Laura mentioned link between open data and the voluntary guidelines uh, the fact that the governments are the guidance of data and uh, the, the importance of quality of data and the governance of data. And uh, finally, Ellen mentioned the language, a multi stakeholder uh, platform and coordination. Um, <clears throat> And one of the question uh, was related to the to the fact that if the these activities, these initiatives uh, with, the, for instance, customary rights and indigenous people are uh, legally recognized by governments. So to me, uh, all of these uh, words, which are not just words, but are much more than words, uh, match very well with the work that we have been doing uh, since uh, 2010, when we started uh, the implementation actually of open source uh, um, solutions in the in the area of land administration. <clears throat> so the, uh, if I can just very quickly uh, provide the, the background of our work. Uh, we started implementing these projects on um, open source systems, uh, which is Sola, <clears throat> the SOLA uh, open source software, because we uh, looked and based our, our work on three considerations. One is that the access to land and natural resources associated with tenure security. Second is that the effective and transparent land administration is fundamental in ensuring the, the security of tenure. <clears throat> and then, then the land administration <clears throat> can improve their services by using uh, by using digitized systems computerized systems for for lender registration so the the system that we have developed and that then we also um, extended for the for the implementation and the operationalization of the voluntary guidelines in the recognition of the uh, legitimate tenure rights, so not just 
what was called formal uh, land rights, but also extending to the uh, recognition and protection of the legitimate tenure rights with a new man based approach, meaning that we have been working a lot in the context of customary rights, community rights. And, um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> And so uh, you mentioned, um, Javier, the work that we have done in, for instance, in Sierra Leone, where we have uh, used the, the, the system that we developed, which is called Open Tenure, uh, for working with communities to protect communities' tenure right and to include the, the, the gender component. So the women, not just the women though, but also the youth of the, of the communities. So um, to, I, I would like to highlight the importance of participation and inclusion in this process. So um, open, uh, open data, having data which are um, accessible uh, to the population and uh, is, um, has as a basis the fundamental basis is the, the process, the inclusion and the participation of communities. So in order to be able to secure tenure rights, to secure legitimate tenure rights, to, uh, to combat corruption, uh, we have to, to, uh, to establish a sound process, uh, which is a participatory process. So tools like Open Tenure, there are many uh, on the ground. Uh, what is fundamental is the process that accompany the use of these tools. And, and the tool itself has to be designed and used accordingly to the voluntary guidelines principles in terms of uh, women inclusion and um, safeguards for vulnerable people. And also, I, I would like also to mention the youth, because this is an emerging Emerging uh, issue, uh, the, the inclusion of the youth in the process of securing tenure rights. So um, again, back to the to the experience in Sierra Leone. <clears throat> then we have implemented uh, the, the use of the open tenure system uh, involving the, the communities, but not just the communities, involving also the government, because it's important, it's very um, it's, uh, fundamental to have uh, an understanding and a dialogue which includes all the stakeholders. So with the, with the government, as well, we have started uh, Ma Ma together Maria Paula, the... if I may, I'm sorry, I need to enforce yeah. time limitations here. Would you please? Yeah, yes, uh... yes. yeah sorry. Yes, sure. So uh, I just wanted to stress that the importance of it, of the inclusion and the participation of all the stakeholders so that you can, even though there is not yet in place uh, a law, but there is a provision for including and recognizing the customary rights have kickstart a process uh, where they can be recognized. So this is what happened in Sierra Leone and also uh, in Guatemala. Uh, I mean, it, it, that, that's all from my side. And uh, thank you for, for giving me this, this time, uh, Javier. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pablo. I think, uh, unfortunately, we don't have much time, but I think that that information can be made available. We can upload in the chat function some links to the documents where you can find more information on those specific country experiences so that you can, you know, inform yourself as to how uh, these uh, concrete experiences show what can be done to secure tenure rights and, in, uh, and to promote a more open and transparent uh, tenure system. Uh, I, I saw a question uh, and a number of points dealing with not only securing tenure rights, land rights, but also how those rights are used and land use, how land is used, how land is managed in a sustainable way. And in this, in this sense, 
the, the abilities have also led to another further step, not only to secure tenure rights, but also to promote sustainable land use. And this it is being done in joint work with the UNCCD, the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, and now a technical guide on land use, land degradation neutrality is being prepared based on the voluntary guidelines, which is another step forward to sustainability of livelihoods and uh, food systems. In this connection, I would will, I will like to see and check if a, a, a relief press from FAO is online to briefly share with us what is being done with the UNCCD convention uh, to combat the certification. Over, over to you, Aurelie. Hi, Javier, are you hearing me? Yes. Thank you for giving me the floor and thank you for all the presenter for their inspiring speeches and for all the participants. So as mentioned by Chris, indeed, the VGGT as a CFS policy product got a key uptake by a Rio Convention, the one on co to combat desertification during the 14th conference of parties, where for the first time the parties wanted to encourage themselves to use the VGGT in the implementation of the convention, which opened the door to uh, actually gain multiple benefits because also by targeting land degradation neutrality to achieve some elements to leverage some difficulties that exist and to increase governance of tenure. For instance, challenges that are met when uh, addressing land degradation are uh, insecure tenure rights, which prevent people from adopting sustainable practices, whether on public land, whether on commons, uh, or silo policy on tenure and LDN, which prevent effectiveness and which sometimes have a detrimental effect, one on the other. One on the other. Also question of how to safeguard legitimate tenure rights when there are interventions to promote ecosystem restoration, for instance, or to promote access to grievance and redress mechanisms for the most vulnerable. Also how to promote gender equality so that everyone can actually engage into combating desertification. All that are the type of uh, advice and uh, an element that we want to bring forward in the technical guide that we are currently preparing with uh, jointly with you and CCD and that will be brought to the party during the next uh, conference of parties of the convention on, on desertification so in 2022 between May and, and September dates are unknown but uh, it's true that uh, and we can see also how, how the work that was mentioned by all the, the presenters on, on data transparency, on availability of data, or the work that presented Maria Paula on how to uh, promote um, easy system to uh, map rights and to engage into process are the one that needs also to be to, taken into account when uh, coming to fighting desertification. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll get back to the panelists. Thank you, Aurelie. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing that, that with us. Now we know that the VTs are being used not only to secure tenure rights, to improve governance of tenure, but also now leading to tools technical guides to improve management, land management. And, and that's central if you want to secure the sustainability of food systems in the long run. Now, we have addressed some of the questions that have been posed through the questions and answer functions as well as the chat function. And now considering that we are running out of time, we are getting to the end, I would like to invite each one of our guest speakers to, you know, uh, let us hear from them the key message, some central ideas that they, they, they think we ought to take home, to take, that we take with us when we go back to our work, how we can leverage this information, this knowledge. What would be some key messages that you, you would like to share with us today? I would like to start now with our 
a, a colleague a back to Seattle, a Tim, to hear what a, he would like to a, a remind us. Thank you, Javier, and thank you to, to all the panelists. I um, uh, thoroughly enjoyed listening to all the presentations. You know, so much uh, great information here. I would just underline um, what Ellen and, and others have said is that governments here are, are in the driver's seat and, and governments often need uh, help and need to be supported, not just by, by international donors, but also by, by nonprofit organizations to, um, to help them um, fulfill their, their goals and, uh, and objectives around, around land, land data. And then second, uh, underline the point that I think Laura um, emphasized in, in talking about the uh, Open Up Guide in that in the various, well, that land data is uh, among the least open of government data. And, and she, Laura mentioned the several barriers to that. The one barrier I think that deserves underlining is that in many cases, the formal land tenure data doesn't exist at all. That is, it still needs to be, it still needs to be gathered. And the, the process by which it is gathered is so, so important. And the, the, the voluntary guidelines lay out the principles and, and more specifics about how that should be done. And uh, the principles that I would just emphasize are the ones around gender equality, about participation of communities, about transparency, um, because how that data gets, gets collected and the involvement of communities and particularly uh, vulnerable groups within that community is, uh, is gonna be key to, to um, the, the quality of the data and whether it can be used to, to protect the most vulnerable. I'll stop there. Thanks, Javier. Thank you, Tim. Now let's move on to, uh, and let's go back to Buenos Aires and let's hear from Natalie. Hi everybody. Uh, so thanks for the, the amazing presentations. I just, I'm gonna go quickly to, to one point. Uh, open data is seen as a super uh, high technical uh, type of policy. And there should be a, a place where we create a strategy from a technical point of view about the creation, the recollection and the publication of data, taking into account privacy concerns. But at the same time, and as I said, from the very beginning, you need to also create a strategy to connect with communities, to connect through community leaders, a strategy uh, that actually addresses the way that community um, can be engaged within their own times and manners. Um, so uh, participation in, in their own terms, not, not uh, trying to bring them into your own platform, just go, go there and, and participation from the very beginning of any open data policy. All right, very good. Now, talking about data, let's hear from uh, our colleague, Laura Mejuloro uh, from the LAN portal. Thank you, thank you, um, Javier. One point, uh, well, just land data is crucial. It's crucial for good land governance and uh, can support decisions, policy, transparency, can be important drivers for innovation, economic and social development. But um, as my colleagues already stated, data governance is important. So the who and the how is very important. So the data governance should be put into the agenda of land governance and uh, more in general to the, to the sustainable development agenda. So how data is collected, how data is published, who is part of the process, who has a voice, what data represents, what do they document? So the Open Data Charter and Land Portal Open Up Guide is a step towards that direction. And, uh, and I hope there will be uh, support and collaboration. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, thank you, Laura. Um, well, clearly it seems that, that, that governments have a responsibility here. And so, but we have here the, the possibility to hear from a government representative, uh, Honorable Helen Pratt, uh, so I would like to uh, invite her to, uh, you know, see what what her message, the key message that she would like us to take 
away from this uh, event will be. Thank you very much. So I think uh, <clears throat> so much has been said today, but I want us to remember this idea of the continuum of land rights. And as we develop these systems, I want us to look at fit for purpose and fit for context solutions that address the issues and challenges through a bottom up approach, supporting inclusive processes that strengthen women's land rights, but also promote the rights of the most marginalized groups in our society. I ask that we continue to hold governments like myself accountable to ensure that these systems are not only developed, but they're implemented so that we continue to support equitable land rights and we continue to improve the lives of all of our citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, uh, Ellen, for those words. And I think um, of this uh, exchange, of this dialogue, I would like to uh, now remind uh, everyone that all the information of, of side events are uh, concerning the CFS are in the website, the CFS website. And um, please uh, remember that consultation, if, if you have the time, the LAMP portal made a reference to. Uh, and so we hope that we will be in touch, continuing in our work to secure tenure rights and to promote improved a governance of tenure through open and transparent land administration systems. With this, I would like to close and I want to check with a land portal if they would like to have a closing remark.